This morning we'll be reading the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what we will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. So let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, at the end of the Old Testament are the 12 books of the Minor Prophets, or as we might say, the Lesser Known Prophets. But they're small books, so we don't read them very much in church. Today's prophet, Habakkuk, is the eighth Minor Prophet. And the book of Habakkuk, as we have it in our Bible, is just three chapters long. So, what do you know about Habakkuk? Anything? Have you ever heard of it? No. Yeah. You've heard of it, yeah. To help us understand our scripture reading today, let me give you um, some context. The book of Habakkuk was probably written some 600 years before the birth of Jesus, before Judah was captured by the Babylonians. There's no biographical information on the prophet Habakkuk, but he's revealed in this book as a man of prayer who pours out his soul to God in anguish and in confidence. The book tells of Habakkuk's dialogue with God. There's no direct exaltation to us, the reader. It's a book that's very similar to the book of Job, although Job is a lot longer. <laughs> Job protests to God about all the bad things that are happening in his life and tries to understand why they're happening. Habakkuk is doing the same thing, but instead of protesting about personal problems, he's concerned about the injustices happening in the nation. So, there's two parts to it. The first couple of chapters, there's a superscription, which just is the one sentence introduction introducing Habakkuk. And then he complains to God, and then we have God's response. And then he complains again to God about that response. <laughs> and God responds again, including five woes. And then the second part of the book, there's another one line telling us that it's Habakkuk's prayer. And then Habakkuk pleads with God, and God responds with a vision. And then we finish with Habakkuk's hopeful praise. <clears throat> so we heard read the first superscription and Habakkuk's first, the first part of Habakkuk's um, complaint. The kingdom of Judah is full of those who have become unrighteous. They've misappropriated the Torah and the law, and they're acting unjustly towards the righteous. And so Habakkuk confronts God, assuming that if God hears the cry of the righteous, then God will save the righteous. And since things are not going well for the righteous, apparently God can't be listening. So Habakkuk demands God's attention. So that was what Michael read to us, those first few verses. He said, O oh, oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack. Justice never prevails. 
The wicked surround the righteous and judgment comes forth perverted. So then God gets to respond to Habakkuk and says that he will send the Chaldeans, who we know as the Babylonians, who will punish the wicked. And then Habakkuk complains back to him again, the second complaint. He said, the Babylonians are even worse than the leaders we had before. <laughs> and the invasion causes more injustice than the injustice that it has just swept out. And Habakkuk argues that God's justice cannot be established with unjust means. And so Habakkuk finished this second lament with the verse that we heard read at the beginning of chapter 2. He says, I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch and see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. So Habakkuk is going to watch and wait patiently for God to respond. So that was the end of Habakkuk's second complaint. And now we also heard Michael read God's response, or at least the beginning of it. So God responds to Habakkuk, and God's going to paint a vision, and he wants it written on tablets. Listen to those words again. God answered me. He said, write the vision plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come, it won't delay. Look at the proud, their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. So even though it may be slow in coming, it will eventually come. And that last phrase, the righteous will live by their faith, is the hope of this vision. God may use corrupt nations, but he doesn't endorse them and will bring them down eventually, along with the other nations that act like them. And the vision is elaborated by a series of five woes that describe the types of injustice that's perpetrated by nations like Babylon. So the first two woes are about unjust economic practices, like the level of interest charge that keep people in debt and builds wealth through crooked means. The third one is about slave labor and treating humans like animals and threatening them with violence. The fourth one is about the abuse of alcohol by irresponsible leaders who spend time partying while others are suffering under their leadership. And the fourth one is about idolatry, making money and power and national security into gods so people become slaves to the national empire. Most nations eventually become Babylon, even today. I was struck by just how timeless those worlds are. And God's answer to Habakkuk becomes God's answer to later generations, to us. Will this cycle of behavior go on forever? Well, in chapter 3, Habakkuk's prayer, Habakkuk pleads to God to act now as God has acted in the past. And God responds using the Exodus story to paint an image of a future Exodus, where evil is once again defeated, justice comes to all, and the oppressed are rescued. And then Habakkuk concludes his prayer and our book with hopeful praise. He says, though the fig tree doesn't blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fruit fields yield no food, Though the flock is cut off from the fold, there's no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. So even though the world is falling apart, Habakkuk chooses to trust um, in the joy and the promises of God. That there's, this is a shining example of how the righteous are to live by faith. And that's the book of Habakkuk. So what are the timeless lessons for us from Habakkuk? Well, one, the first one, is watch and wait. Habakkuk stands there at his watch post, watching and waiting for an answer. He stands there, waiting patiently. It's a position up high where he can see over the land below, and where God can see him, because he's standing up high. 
He stations himself there. He's not going anywhere until he receives God's reply. His argumentative lament presupposes that someone is listening. He believes an answer will come, and it does. Habakkuk's steadfast, faithful watching and waiting ends with God's vision arriving. And that response wasn't only for him, it was for his whole community. This photo that's on the front of our bulletin today was at the, taken at the top of a church bell tower. There's a panoramic view from it over the local area. Nowadays, our churches aren't always the tallest buildings in the area. You might have to go to the top of a skyscraper for that same view, or to St. Louis Arch, or Seattle Space Needle, or the Statue of Liberty, or some other iconic landmark. Perhaps it's a place to go to be alone, a place to get some perspective, a place where you can see everything, a place where time seems to stand still. Answers don't always come quickly. We need to slow down and wait patiently, a task that is not easy. Are we pausing long enough to listen to God's voice? Do we trust that God will speak to us like Habakkuk trusted God would speak to him? Catholic spiritual writer Edward Hayes tells this story. He says there's a young man who went to visit a wise hermit, a monk, and he finds the monk and the monk's dog <coughs> sitting in the sun outside a cave. And he asks him, why is it that some who seek God come to the desert and seek for a year and then leave, and others, like you, remain faithful to the quest for a lifetime? And the monk says to the young man, well, one day my dog and I were sitting here in the sun and a white rabbit ran in front of us. And my dog gave chase. And other dogs then joined in and joined in the chase. And what a sight it was with a pack of dogs all running after this rabbit. And after a while, one by one, the other dogs got discouraged and frustrated and they dropped out until only my dog was left pursuing the rabbit. The young man was a bit confused by the story and asked the monk to explain the connection between the rabbit and the quest for God. And the hermit said, the other dogs didn't continue the chase because they hadn't seen the rabbit. Once you see the rabbit, you never give up the chase. Habakkuk counsels patience. What if we station ourselves at a watch post and watch and wait and demand that God clear a way for us? and send us a glimpse of healing and wholeness for us, ourselves, and the world. And my second thing this morning on a timeless message is our Lutheran brothers and sisters are going to be celebrating Reformation Day tomorrow, marking October the 31st, 1517, that day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany as he protested against the Roman Catholic Church's practice of the sale of indulgences, it caused the start of the Protestant Reformation. The verse that we read today, the righteous live by their faith, sums up the confession of faith that was central to the Reformation. It's Habakkuk that's quoted three times in the New Testament. We might not remember Habakkuk, but he's quoted. Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38-39. It's central to Paul's teaching to justification by faith. It's the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation. It's not about our works, it's about our faith. So what does it mean to live by faith and not by our own actions? Habakkuk's description of the world he faced sounds remarkably contemporary. Society torn about by violence and destruction. The legal system is slack and at worst corrupt, justifying the establishment. The wealthy and powerful are protected as they squeeze the powerless and the needy. Basic rights, such as clean drinking water, are still being fought for around the world. These are the questions that we face today. And God's response is to speak of a vision of justice, righteousness, and peace. And some 600 years later, after he spoke to Habakkuk, 
We know God becomes flesh and sends us Jesus, showing us what a faithful, living a faithful life looks like. And so we have two pictures. The righteousness live in the promise of the vision, living in a full faith that it will come. And then the second picture that came from the end of the Habakkuk book, that we can rejoice in God's blessings even when they're not manifest right now. A rejoicing that even though life will bring low moments, that better moments will come. The book of Habakkuk doesn't resolve the problem of God's justice and attentiveness. It puts forth a model for waiting. In the time between the promises of God to deliver the righteous and the actual time of deliverance. Waiting doesn't silence the lament. Lament and exultation are the, are the response. Waiting includes lament, petition, trembling, and rejoicing. As Anne Lamont says in her book, Plan B, Further Thoughts on Faith, she says, Faith includes noticing the mess, the emptiness and discomfort, and letting it be there until some light returns. The life of faith is to live in the between of complaint and struggle and God's right time on the other, knowing that God has answered us in the past and will answer us again. So let's walk by faith, watching and waiting together. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are good news for a weary world. You are hope for people in despair. Teach us to wait on you, to keep watch and never to give up hope. And as we do so, even as injustice seems as if it is winning, may we find encouragement and choose trust and joy in your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.